If you would, please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as you know, today is Palm Sunday. But it's also the second Sunday of our Redemptive Violence series. If you were here last week, we talked about how violence has become a way of life. And through this lifestyle of violence, we continue to support the idea that the only way humanity can be redeemed is through violent means. This morning, we are going to look at the second concept of the myth of redemptive violence as proposed by theologian Walter Wink which is the story of the victory of order over chaos by means of violence. To capture the fullness of this story, we must go back, though, to the beginning of time. The oldest of our creation myths, the Enuma Elish, describes a rather violent beginning whereby the gods do battle. Often it's over very insignificant things. One God kills another God, and out of that dead God's blood, all of humanity is formed. Rather gruesome, really. The Hebrew story of creation, which has also been adopted as the Christian story of creation, is different. Vastly different. We are told that God hovered over the deep, the void, the ocean, there's something there. We just don't know what it is. And I'd like to think of this deep as potential. And it is out of this potential that God began to order the chaos. And the writers of Genesis imagine that God was somehow transforming one thing into another. Out of this deep, God through His breath called forth each aspect of creation, day and night, land and sea, animals, sea creatures, trees bearing fruit, and finally the crowning jewel, humanity. We understand intellectually that creation did not come into being quite this way. The billions of years that it took for our planet to become what it is now, the evolutionary process, a remarkable, it's just remarkable still if you believe in God as a creator. Even scientifically, it is plausible to understand that God did not create all that we see out of a vacuum, out of nothingness, but rather everything was created out of something. The idea that God ordered chaos is a relatively new idea in Christianity. For a long time, scholars debated how God created out of nothingness, but never seemed to argue that the word void in the text didn't necessarily mean emptiness as in a vacuum, but rather something that was undefinable. We pause to look at all that was created. We can't help but notice just how elegant creation is. In 1975, a mathematician by the name of Benoit Mandelbrot coined the term fractal to describe the fractional dimensions examined in the varieties of geometric patterns found in nature. Mathematically, the equations used to develop these fractional dimensions were relatively simple, but as they were repeated multiple times, they created these intricate patterns that are seen throughout nature. Mountain ranges are the largest structures to be examined through the use of fractal dimensions, but where we see these patterns most often are in simple things like fruits, vegetables, flowers, and shells, to name but a few. If you've ever looked at a, a romesco, do you know what romesco is? I'm seeing a lot of blank faces. It's, it's a type of cauliflower, and it's green, and it's a beautiful example of fractals, the patterns that have formed all around you take a shell and you cut it in half, a nautilus, you see the patterns. If you look down at something like a cactus, you can see the shape of the leaves and how they form these really intricate patterns. It's amazing. 
creation. So elegance and creation or the use of creativity at all is a departure from the violent story of creation from the ancient Babylons. At this point, you might be asking why any of this is important. Why does the creation myth, what does it have to do with Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey? For the Hebrew people, everything. The relationship between God and creation is the foundation for their relationship with one another. Without the story of creation, the Israelites would never have developed their ideas of justice and peace. Throughout Hebrew Scripture, God is calling on the Hebrew people to live differently than the communities of people living around them. For the Israelites, though, a God who created them was never enough. First, God had to start over with creation because humanity was so vile toward one another. Later, they wanted earthly leaders, so God gave them kings. Then they wanted prophets, so God gave them prophets. Not being satisfied with what they had, they deviated from the path that God had laid out for them, and they suffered as a result. This is where the myth of redemptive violence begins to show itself. Starting with the story of the flood, we start to veer away from the elegance of creation through the creative ordering of chaos by God to the violent measures God would use to destroy humanity in order to redeem it. This plot twist aims to make sense of a natural disaster that wasn't easily understood by a people steeped only in faith rather than in science. There are multiple places in the Hebrew text where the author understands God to be an arbiter of both good and evil. God gives and God takes away. God brings the sun and the rain. God is the giver of life and the bringer of death. These concepts were ingrained in Jewish culture. When the Israelite people were in process of being liberated from Egypt, there was never a question in the minds of the writers that it was God who killed all the Egyptian male children and spared all the Hebrew male children. It was the same God who led them into the desert to die. And the same God delivered them into Canaan. And the same God delivered them into captivity several times for disobedience. At this point in the history of the Israelite people, there wasn't a concept of a godly counterpart that muddled up God's work. God was it. The idea of Satan, the devil, and Lucifer were all later concepts. One more layer of intrigue to better explain why bad things happen to good people, or more to the point, why good people do bad things. We need a reason to reconcile what happens to Jesus after riding into Jerusalem as one who is triumphant and victorious. It is difficult for us to go from his entrance to his death without, without asking, what happened? The story doesn't really make any sense without understanding the whole of the story, the whole of the history of the Israelite people, but especially what was happening in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' arrival. In my mind, I can think of no other time when this story could have taken place, really. Jesus' entrance at the beginning of Passover feast is prophetic. How can we bring into harmony the sparing of Jewish Egyptian children, I mean Jewish children in Egypt, with the death of this Jewish child at Passover? The timing of the story lends itself to the myth of the violence perpetrated against Jesus. He becomes the Paschal Lamb, the ultimate sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. The more I wrestle with this story of Jesus and his triumphal ride into Jerusalem and his eventual death on the cross, there are several things that have surfaced that keep me begging for more wisdom, greater understanding. A close reading of the biblical text tells us that Jesus states on more than one occasion that he must die for, for the forgiveness of sins. I began to wonder if theologically there was a difference between Jesus dying to forgive our sins and Jesus dying for the forgiveness of sins. 
These two statements feel different to me, but I couldn't figure out why. I looked up the difference between the uses of two and four in the English language, which actually helped a little bit. And surprisingly, it carried me all the way back to where I started the idea of ordering chaos through the acts of creation. Everything is a process with God. Even God's relationship with humanity is a process. I want more than anything to understand God, to know the mind of God. That is why I, Izzy Harbin, study theology. I want to explore God's nature so thoroughly that I can emulate the God of creation. God, from the beginning of my limited understanding, has always been about revelation, which is also a process. Nothing has ever come to me all at once. Children don't learn everything there is to know about the universe in one day. We come to know bits and pieces over time. We use systems like scaffolding to help children build a foundation of knowledge upon which they can build greater knowledge. It is all a process. God works with us in much the same way. Our lived experience tells us that God operates a particular way. I'm intrigued by the characteristics we assign to God that are not consistent with our lived experience. For Jesus' entire ministry, He pointed to God as His Father. Think about that. Even the idea of a heavenly father comes with its own set of difficulties. Not everyone on earth has a father they wish to celebrate. So to have a kind, compassionate, loving father in heaven that wants to see us succeed in life might be counterintuitive for many. However, if we can imagine for even a moment that our fathers were all the best that fathers can be, can you imagine that that father ever saying to you as a child, I cast you into darkness for all eternity? I cannot imagine this. Somehow, though, we managed to develop this Easter formula that has Jesus riding into Jerusalem triumphant only to be crucified at week's end. And we are taught that God orchestrated Jesus' death so that our sins would be forgiven. We have to believe that Jesus died for our sins to de- legitimize that reality for, our lo- for ourselves. And if we don't, then God will cast us into outer darkness for all eternity. That's the formula. Preaching on Palm Sunday and throughout Holy Week is one of the most difficult times for me in the liturgical season. I cannot adhere to the orthodox teachings of the church. Sorry. My lived experience tells me that there is something hugely wrong with this picture. And the more I work out the two and the four issue, another piece of what causes my spirit to be disturbed by the orthodox message comes into focus. When I say Jesus died to forgive our sins, it is personal. This statement reflects a personal act by Jesus on my behalf. This also reflects the need for personal salvation. However, if we say Jesus died for the forgiveness of sins, we are talking about a collective participation in something greater than oneself. Jesus believed in the power of community, the willingness of the community to use its power for the elevation of the least of these. Everything Jesus taught throughout His ministry was in service to the community as a whole. Even God didn't demand that Jesus die so that we can be reconciled back to God. There wasn't a price tag on Jesus, nor the necessity of Jesus' blood to cover our sins for all eternity. No. This is not what God required of Jesus, nor is it what God requires of us. This formula does not match the character of God that we have experienced throughout our lives. Still out of this chaotic moment... God brings order. God recognizes that we are flawed by design. In the moment of creating humanity, God desired for us to have free will so that we would always seek God of our own volition. The ultimate elegance in creation is that we were intentionally made perfectly imperfect. 
Jesus' death on the cross illustrates that we cannot see what is so clearly in front of us. We must assign meaning to Jesus' death that removes us from any responsibility. It is all rather neat and tidy, really. But it paints God, the very all that created everything so elegantly, as a being none of us want to be associated with, especially when benevolence is turned into malevolence. God, our Creator, the one who ordered chaos and continues to order chaos, is forever in the process of drawing all of creation back to God. We have always been and will always be redeemed. The transformative power of God is not found in death, but in the resurrection. We are constantly being remade in the image of God. As a community of faith, we continue to seek how God changes our view of the world. We do not have to be violent people to redeem ourselves, but rather a peaceful people born of promise and hope. May it be so. Amen.